do I believe in God? And I don't like that question. And people have complained at me a lot, and I'm sure they have their reasons because they don't like my answers, you know, and I, I have two answers. I, I can't figure out why I don't like the question exactly. I've got three, I had three sort of burgeoning hypotheses. One was, it's none of your business. That's the first one. So it was like a privacy issue. Like it seemed to me to be a question that was too private to be answered properly. Mark 16 and 15. And he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. This is simply not a privacy issue. You know, if you feel like it's a privacy issue, it's much more likely that this is a sin issue. This is the issue of you not wanting to proclaim because you don't want to give up the life that you have away from Jesus. This is not a privacy issue. This is, this is an issue of someone being selfish and not wanting to give up the things that he really loves and idolizes. And like, do you mean the words? Do you mean to say the words, I believe in God? Does that indicate that you believe in God? Like, I don't know what you mean by believe exactly. Is what you believe what you say? or what you act out. Now, you know, I would say to some degree it's both, but if push comes to shove, as far as I'm concerned, what you believe is what you act out, not what you say. And then, you know, and if you're an integrated person, then what you act out and what you say are the same thing, and then you're a person whose word can be trusted, right? Because what you say and what you do are isomorphic, they're the same thing. But it, belief is instantiated in action, so I, I, I have also, suggested that I act as if I believe in God. Romans 3 and 23. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You know, no one lives out faith perfectly. You know, so that's just, you know, a bad understanding of who we are as humans. But also, no one lives out disbelief perfectly either. Nobody truly lives as if nothing really matters. No one really lives as if there's no real right and wrong. People don't live as if they are just germs that are evolved into a higher order. If someone really lived like this, they would live a lot like a wild animal does. And people don't do that. We, we, we live as if people have value, a different value than other animals. This is all because deep down we know that we are made in the image of God and we know that there is something different about us as humans. As the Bible tells us in Romans also that every man knows there's a God but we suppress it in unrighteousness. Only one Christian and he died on the cross. And, and that's, that's a, you know, perhaps an extreme statement but... Actually this is an incoherent statement. Saying that Jesus was the only Christian doesn't even make sense because being a Christian is a follower of Jesus, someone who follows Jesus. Of course, no one can follow Jesus perfectly, but when we read the Bible, the book that tells us about Jesus, we read that every single person has fallen short of the glory of God, and we hear countless stories about sinners who have made mistakes in the past and just continue to repent, fall on their knees, ask for forgiveness, and go back to following Jesus. It's not about perfection, it's about the direction. But to call Jesus a Christian doesn't even make sense. We are followers of Christ, and this is what makes us Christians. Right here in Acts 11:26, And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. The first time people were called Christians was in Antioch. This is after Jesus Christ had already died on the cross and had risen from the dead and ascended up to heaven. The first people to be called Christians were the people who followed Jesus. So in order to be a Christian, you are a follower. These are imperfect people that are following Jesus Christ to the best of their ability, and the ability itself is given from God. What? As I've gone through the Old Testament, I did a bunch of lectures last year. And so what are you called upon? Well, you're called upon initially to act out the spark of divinity that's within you by confronting potential with the logos that's within you, which means to take 
the opportunities that are in front of you, in the potential future, and to transform it into the present in the best possible way using truth and courage and careful articulation as your, as your, as your, as your, as your guide. So that's the first thing you're called on to do. No, that's not right. The first thing we're called to do is the exact thing that he is not willing to do, and that is to confess Jesus Christ as Lord with your mouth. Right here in Romans 10 and 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So this is the first thing that a believer has to do not any kind of work or anything else to build up your self-righteousness or to make you feel like you're you're doing something because we are completely dependent on the will of God. So the first thing we do is openly confess Jesus Christ as Lord and put our faith in Christ to work through us. And then the second is to make the proper sacrifices. That's the Cain and Abel story. It's like you, you want something, you genuinely want it, you want to set the world straight, then you let go of what's necessary and you pursue. You let go of what isn't necessary, no matter what it is, no matter what it is, and then you pursue what's necessary. And then No, once again, he's wrong. It's not about pursuing anything that you want. It's not about pursuing making this world a better place. It's, not, it's about pursuing God. It's about building a relationship with God. This is what our mission is as a believer. Our believer is always God. What he is describing is a man-centered, work-based religion. And this is what a lot of the Jews also follow. And this is why when Jesus came, he had to correct them over and over and rebuke them because they were all about the outside. And what he's doing, he's, he's taking stories that are really meant for a spiritual reason and they're clearly a spiritual reason, but he's trying to um, take them and make a pragmatic way of them. He's trying to take this new age pragmatism that is really a philosophy of the Greeks. He's twisting the spiritual aspect and the understanding of what the Bible really means into some kind of Americanized, pragmatic, how can I work, make this work for society? How can I work make this work better for me and my family? But that's not what it's about. We put our faith in God and we build our relationship with God and we let him take care of these other issues. As we're told in Matthew 6 and 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. We seek God, we seek his kingdom, not things on this earth, not trying to fix this earth. We need too much fixing ourselves. And so we need more humility and we need to be completely dependent on God. Maybe you sacrifice your children to God. That, that was the story. Um, that's the, one of the next stories that comes up, of course, and you think, well, that's pretty barbaric, and the way the story's laid out, of course it is, but um, that isn't exactly what it means. It means that what you try to do when you raise children is that you try to do everything you can to impress upon them by imitation and by instruction and by love and by encouragement that they are crucial beings in the world whose ethical decisions play an important role in shaping the structure of reality itself and that they have the moral responsibility to do that. And I don't see how he could possibly get what he just said out of the story of Abraham sacrificing Isaac. I don't see how he could possibly get that. That was a complete freestyle. He just like made that up. This is one of the most basic lessons in the Bible. And it's very simple to understand. It's just simply that we don't put anything ahead of God. We don't idolize our, even our children. We don't idolize anything on this earth, any person. We put God first. And this was God setting Abraham straight and putting God back on the throne of his heart because his son Isaac had took in that place instead of God. And then, of course, he didn't really have to sacrifice his son. So it's not really so barbaric after all. Christ says, don't call me good. There's no one that's good but God. That's worth thinking about. The one person that in principle, in our ancient stories, had the right to make some direct connection between himself and the divine, was unwilling to do it when challenged. Wow, really? Jesus unwilling to make a connection with the divine? You're talking about the same Jesus who said, if you've seen the Father, you've seen me. Are you talking about the same Jesus 
who said before Abraham was, I am. Then stones were picking up to stone him for blasphemy. Talking about the same Jesus who forgave sins. You know, he twisted this verse too. He said that Jesus said, don't call me good. That's not what he said. He said, why do you call me good? And it's simple. The reason why he was saying this is because this person that came up to Jesus thought Jesus was just a regular teacher. He didn't know who Jesus was. So Jesus is asking him, why are you calling me good? Because he knows this person doesn't know he is God. So he's asking, why do you call me good? There's no one good but God. So this is not God claiming not to be good. As a matter of fact, in John 10 and 14, he says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and they know me. By a simple understanding of these words that are very important, when he says, don't call me good, that's not what he said. He said, why do you call me good? He's asking the person to examine the words that he's saying when you go around calling people good, as he thought Jesus was. I can't see how you can make a higher claim to moral virtue than that. Do you believe in it or not? But imagine that something like that exists, and then you swear allegiance to it, which is to say, I believe in this. I mean, there's a heavy moral burden that comes along with that, just to allow yourself to utter the words without feeling that you should be immediately struck down appropriately by lightning. Well, and so I think that's why that question makes me uncomfortable. It's that I don't think I have a, I don't think I have a right to make that proclamation. Once again, he's off. It's not a high moral claim to say that you believe in God. As a matter of fact, this is the most humble thing you can do. This is saying that, you know what? I don't believe in myself anymore. I believe in God. I'm, I'm going to stop trying to do it myself. But I have to first repent. I have to come to repentance and understand that I'm completely deprived and I can't do it on myself. I don't believe in myself to do it anymore. I believe in God to take care of me. I believe in God to take over my life and I need God. So it's actually the opposite. The person who's making a high moral claim is a person who doesn't claim the name of God, who doesn't say they believe in God because then they believe in their self and their own morality and their own goodness. That is the real high moral claim. Because you're pretty much saying that you is where the goodness is coming from. But when you believe in God, you believe in his goodness. And you have to understand, us as Christians, we believe in a supernatural God who sends his Holy Spirit to come and do the good works through us. The Bible tells us that every good thing comes from heaven. Every good thing comes from God. So we don't take credit for any of the good we do, but we do take credit for the sin that we commit and we repent for it. And then lastly, he says he feels like he doesn't have the right to make that proclamation. But on the contrary, he actually has the command to make that proclamation in his faith in God. Right here in Matthew 10, 33. But whoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. Something to think about.